Shalom and uh, welcome everyone. Good morning to our uh, weekly mentoring hour. Thank you all for uh, joining the mentoring hour this uh, morning. Uh, before we begin, can I ask one of our students to please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone like us like to lead in prayer? With our students. Yes, please go ahead, Daniel. Thank you. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Lord, bless you for yet another opportunity to study your word. We pray that you will give us the understanding, the knowledge to know your word better in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Lord, we bless you. We give you all the praise, we give you all the honor. Lord, have your way this hour in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Son. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, this morning, we have Pastor Roshan join us, uh, who would uh, be uh, sharing on places in the Bible. Sounds very interesting. Uh, looking forward to hearing from Pastor Roshan, after which uh, we will take up uh, your questions, your doubts that you have on what he has shared. Or you can also ask questions and doubts that you have uh, pertaining to uh, the course content, the uh, you know, the lectures that have uh, been taught or, uh, you know, if you're reading something on the Bible, you haven't understood it and you can ask questions on that as well or anything regarding to life and ministry. So you can feel free to unmute your mics, ask your questions or even uh, post your questions in the chat section and our uh, faculty uh, will do our best to uh, address or answer your questions. Uh, over to Pastor Roshan Joannis. Thank you, Pastor Selina. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you all for joining uh, for this uh, for the weekly mentoring hour. Uh, my name is Roshan, as you would already know. Um, I'm just going to uh, share a little bit about uh, places of the Bible uh, or the land of the Bible, so to speak, and uh, very briefly uh, give an introduction, <clears throat> maybe like the basics to the basics of uh, biblical geography. And we, we'll see where we can go from there, okay? Uh, I hope you can all hear me. And uh, right, let me share my screen. Thank you, uh, Sanjay. All right. Um, one of the first things, uh, you know, when we meet a person for the first time, uh, after we ask their name, or the, the, at least most of us, uh, we ask them, where are they from? Isn't it? Yeah. Um, if you may ask, okay, hey, what's your name? You're meeting them for the first time, and then you immediately go on to ask, uh, you know, where I, where are you from? And uh, and if and when they say that, okay, let's say they're from a certain place, they're from, let's say, uh, from Hyderabad, uh, you'll be like, okay, hey, yeah, you know, you immediately associate the, the city with. Uh, oops, sorry, something happened. Um, Give me a minute, guys. Let me just reshare. So, yeah, as I was saying, uh, you know, you immediately associate um, them with, okay, Hyderabad, biryani, and uh, whatnot, right? Uh, let me just ask another question for us. Uh, how many of you us love nature? You can give a thumbs up or just say, yes, I do in the chat. <laughs> right. how, many of you all, uh, how many of us love the outdoors? Um, you know. Like we like to go hiking, we, um, you know, we like uh, creation or, you know, we connect with cre creation or nature better. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, uh, me too. Um, you know, I like the outdoors, I like hiking. Um, and not as much as, you know, I, I now I like them in my heart. <laughs> uh, but yeah, physically, it's just a little, just a little challenging, not a lot, not very challenging, but it, it's all good. Uh, you know, so for most of the times, right? Um, when we read the Bible, we kind of we get stuck uh, in what we are reading and studying, which is all fine, but uh, we forget the space that it was written in, the land uh, it was written in. And so, um, I hope that today, uh, in this just an introduction to geography, I uh, you know I, I hope that we will take away what is we will understand a little bit of what biblical geography is and. Um, how we can integrate 
uh, biblical geography or geography in uh, into our Bible reading, so to speak. Okay. Um, so let's begin to, by understanding uh, what is geography. You know, I, we are still in Bible college. This is still uh, mentoring. Uh, you know, why are we talking about geography? Uh, just give me a little time to, uh, you know, share the basics of it, and then we dive into biblical stories for sure. Okay. So, uh, what is geography? It has three separate categories when you study geography, and um, I've always been fascinated by it. I'm always studying maps and atlas. Um, keep teaching my wife about the different places that she doesn't know of. Uh, but yeah, so geography cons uh, consists of three separate categories. One is the physical geography, there's the human geography, and natural history. Okay, so what is a physical geography? Um, it studies the natural features on the surface of the Earth and the natural forces that affect them. Okay, so pay attention. Physical geography is a study where it studies the natural features on the surface of the Earth and the natural forces that affect them. Um, for example, in, if you look at this image, um, you will see there are hills, a um, little bit of mountains, There's the there are the plains, there's the lake. And so these, these are the natural features on the surface of the Earth uh, when also Physical geography consists of the natural forces like the wind, the rain, the earthquakes, uh, volcanoes, etc., um, etc. Et so all of this consists of a physical geography. Uh, this, by the way, is the Sea of Galilee um, by the city of Capernaum. Okay, um, so that's physical geography leading into human geography uh, is uh, how human beings interact with the physical geography. Right? How do we as human beings interact with the natural features and the natural forces um, of the physical geography. Uh, the way, how do we, the way we grow our food, our crops, uh, the way we process our food, the way we collect water, um, yeah, and we build our homes, uh, the way we travel, and at the end of life, even the way we bury. All of this factors in uh, to the physical geography and the human geography and how we integrate uh, interact with our environment, the surroundings, isn't it? Um, so, I mean, if you notice, uh, uh, at least, uh, you know, the houses that are built in the city of Bangalore look very different from the houses that are built in uh, hill stations, like for Uti or uh, even Mangalore. Right? Um, um, a part of my family is from the city of Mangalore. And, uh, you know, as kids, when we used to travel, um, you know, by bus, uh, the way I would recognize that we are, uh, you know, getting close to Mangalore is by looking at the houses, that the, the, the way that they were built. They use a particular kind of piles, uh, a different kind of uh, brick example, right? And so uh, and that's what human geography is all about. And it also affects our food. Like, for example, <clears throat> uh, you know, in, just within a state, uh, it's like Tamil Nadu, uh, the biryani that you get from South Tamil Nadu will be very different from the biryani that you get in the North Tamil Nadu uh, or the East or the West, right? That's why you have, uh, sorry guys, I, I like biryani. <laughs> so, uh, why? Because of, uh, of of the way it's grown uh, and the ingredients that's available, etc., etc., right? Uh, yeah, amen. <laughs> Uh, so we have the physical geography, we have the human geography and how we interact with them, uh, with the physical geography. And then we have the natural history, which is simply the availability of uh, the plants, the kind of insects that, that grow there, the trees, uh, you know, and the animals that inhabit that particular region. Right? Um, natural. So there's the physical geography. The human geography and the natural history. Uh, natural history talks about the trees and the insects and uh, the animals that inhabit that particular region. Right. So uh, um, some of you are already wondering. I can almost hear your mind voice. <laughs> okay, all this is good. Uh, but where are we going with all of this information? Um, right. And so, you know, I heard one of the scholar, biblical scholars say that Bible was written uh, for us, but it was not written to us in a sense the Bible was written for me to read it, to be encouraged, to be nurtured, nourished. Uh, but it was written by 40 different authors uh, over the span of 1,500 years or so, and in three different continents. And so the audience were different. The authors were different, 40 different authors who hardly met each other. And, uh, and so 
I think that begs the question, okay, uh, how are we going to study the Bible? And there are so many different ways in how we can study the Bible. And I believe that uh, understanding the geography, the land of it, uh, the land of the Bible gives, will help us or open up a different perspective in the way that we can interact or understand the scriptures better. Okay, um, so Bible by no means is a geography book, but it has geography in the book. Okay, um, so one of the first thing, now we'll look at uh, the three instances from the Bible um, and how all of these three categories interact with each other. There are so many instances, so many stories, uh, it's filled with it, but because of the time, um, we are going to just look at three uh, simple um, instances or stories the Bible. Um, okay, uh, the first thing we we'll look at is uh, something called the Tamarisk tree. In Genesis chapter 21, verse 33, uh, it says, Abraham planted a Tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he called upon the name of the Lord, the eternal God. Um, now, it, it, this will come off like a very usual verse uh, because the story doesn't really progress anywhere after, as in it, it takes a different diversion. It, you know, it goes somewhere else from Genesis chapter 22. Uh, it simply says that he planted a tamarisk tree uh, and he called upon the name of the Lord. Uh, now, again, uh, from the uh, geographical perspective, uh, now that we know that the physical, the human, and the natural history part of it, uh, if we were to ask, okay, why tamarisk tree? As in, you know, why not an almond tree or an olive tree or a palm tree or an acacia tree or a balsam tree or a fig fir or, all, or cedars, uh, all these trees that mentions. By the way, uh, trees have the uh, highest number of mentions uh, after human beings in the Bible. It has the second highest number of mentions in the Bible. So trees are important. And so, uh, and then you've got to pause and ask, okay, What's with the tamarisk tree? And if, as an Indian, I would ask, why not coconut tree or a mango tree? You know. Um, so uh, this is an image of the tamarisk tree. Uh, um, a tamarisk tree is a very slow-growing tree. Uh, it, it it grows by an inch per year, and um, it has no fruit uh, that it provides, uh, and it takes a long time for it to grow. Its wood can't even be used to build uh, anything because of its slow growth rate. And uh, what Abraham was doing here is that by planting this tree, he was saying, Lord, I take you at your word. I trust you. And so I'm going to plant this tree uh, in the land that I do not have position of yet, but I believe you. And I'm going to plant this tree as an expression of faith for my generations to come. And when they see this tree, they will know that I trusted you. And uh, the only thing that this tree provided was shade. If uh, a, you know, a Jew or a Bedouin tribe, a Bedouin um, shepherds, they, if they planted this tree, it was not for them. It was for the generations to come. And so Abraham was expressing his faith uh, and also, uh, you know, leaving behind a legacy that his generations, his descendants would be encouraged by what, by his demonstration of faith. And so that is uh, the tamarisk tree. Um, you know, it, it, it's leaves, uh, you know, in such a way that it absorbs uh, the heat during the day uh, and on, also by night. And then it gives this beautiful, uh, shade. This this is one of those perfect tree that you would like to take an afternoon nap under, uh, right? Um, so uh, once again, uh, you know the tamarisk tree was planted. Uh, if it was planted, it was not to be enjoyed by that person because he could not enjoy it because of its slow growth rate. It was to be enjoyed by the descendants, the generations to come. Uh, we'll talk about the pr uh, practical applications in just a bit. Uh, and as you can see in this image, it's surrounded by the desert and the wilderness. Uh, the next hi highest mention uh, of a place uh, in the Bible is the wilderness, uh, right? So in in Deut Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 10, it says, he found him in a desert land and in the wasteland, a howling wilderness. He encircled him, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. Um, so wilderness is mentioned uh, quite a few times uh, in the Bible. Oops, sorry. 
Um, this is just an image of a Judean uh, wilderness. Um, it is wilderness is a dangerous place. It is a, it is a place filled with uncertainty, uh, of the valley of death. Uh, we call it. It's vast and uh, rugged. Uh, it is a land with very little water and very little shade. Uh, it, and it's not a fertile land. That means you can't grow anything in the wilderness. It lacks everything. It lacks everything a human needs to survive. And uh, yet we see in the Bible that it is a place of refuge and provision, uh, like we just read in Deuteronomy chapter 32. In fact, um, in the Hebrew Bible, um, the word for or the name for the book of Numbers is Bar Midbar, which simply means in the wilderness. That's what it is. The, the book of Numbers in the Hebrew simply means in the wilderness. How it became Numbers, I don't know. Uh, but uh, if an entire book is named after a place, um, I think, again, it, it, it needs to get our attention and just study just a little bit further. Mm -hmm. But without going into too much detail, um, just this is another image of the Judean wilderness. And uh, you know, some more scriptures on the wilderness in Jeremiah 2, 2, it says, I remember the devotion of your youth, how uh, as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. Right? It's not a fertile land. Um, and Psalm 78, verse 52 says, but he brought his people out, of, out like a flock. I want you to pay attention to this verse. It says he brought his people out like a flock. Uh, he led them like sheep through the wilderness. Uh, you know, one of the Psalms, a very well-known Psalm that we all know uh, is Psalm 23. And verse 2 says, uh, he leads me beside still waters and he makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, when we read those words, this is the image that comes to us most of the time. It's like lush green Swiss Alps or any European New Zealand Alps or Kashmir. Uh, it's beautiful. It's, you know, full of lush and whatnot. This is what comes to our mind, but uh, it's not what it is. We just looked at the, the Judean wilderness. This is how the terrain looks. Because of its, uh, you know, the natural features and the natural forces, the land has very little rainfall. December and January is the highest amount of rainfall that the land has. And for the rest nine months or so, this is how it looks dry. And um, you know, all these little shrubs or, you know, bushes that you see is what is considered as green pastures. And, uh, you know, so a shepherd would know where to lead the flock, um, you know, in the terrain for his namesake. So uh, his reputation was based on how well he knew the terrain. And, uh, yeah, so this is the wilderness. Um, again, there's so much to study about it, but because of time, I'm just moving a little faster. I hope you all are with me and uh, following. Okay. Uh, and finally, uh, the three instances, what we're learning uh, is uh, with this place called the Caesarea Philippi. Right? In Matthew 16, 13, we see when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Uh, it is such a, uh, a crucial uh, you know, moment um, in the scriptures, um, right, where Jesus asks these questions to his disciples. Um, so just a little bit about this place called Caesarea Philippi, where it is located. Now, to your left, you see the entire ancient map of Israel, um, as you see where Jerusalem is, and, um, and then up north is the city of Capernaum and Galilee. Uh, and so the northern part of Galilee is what is uh, kind of magnified in your right image, right? This is where it is. And again, way up in the north with the red arrow, you see that's where Caesarea Philippi is located. Now, Herod had three sons. One of his sons was Philip, Philippi. Uh, so he named the town after his one of his sons. And then in honor of Caesar, he named it as Caesarea. Philippi. Um, now, this is a, a place which was forbidden for the Jews to go. Uh, be, uh, you know, it's it's closer to this thing. Uh, it's a city, in a city called Banias. Okay, so now that we know where it is located, 
uh, it was forbidden for Jews to go because of uh, every immorality that used to happen in that region, way up in the north. And you see, just above that is Mount Hermon. Right, Mount Hermon is the highest mountain peak in the land of Israel. It's about 9,000 feet or so. So you begin to see snow, uh, you know, in the region. There's ski resorts right now uh, in that land. Okay, so now that we know where this is uh, and where Mount Hermon is, that's where, you know, most of them claim the transfiguration happened. Um, because of the richness and the, the snow that is available and the dew of Mount Hermon, it would come down and there was abundance of fresh water which was useful uh, and because of fresh water uh, the land was fertile and uh, people would uh, worship all kinds of gods uh, fertile gods fertility gods and one of their gods were known as banias or anias uh, this is the bird's eye view of the land of the place of caesarea philippi um, and you can every every evil that you can imagine was uh, took place in this place and that's why it was forbidden for any Jew to go here idolatry and uh, sacrifices human sacrifices animal sacrifices and whatnot um, the the statue of the uh, their god Pan um, was you know half man and his head was made of a goat and that's how his uh, statue was and that's god Pan that they worshipped people in that region worshipped uh, and you see this cave kind of thing right with water um, that was actually was considered as the gateway into the underworld so what people would do is uh, when they when they perform sacrifices uh, like animal sacrifices uh, they would you know sacrifice would go through into the water if the goat does not float uh, that means uh, it, the, their sacrifice has been accepted. And if it floats, that means their sacrifice has not been accepted by their god. Um, and so once again, that was known as the gates of Hades in, other, in our language. And so it was in a, cert, 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 a setting like this, an environment like this, that Jesus would Jesus brought his disciples. And they're, and they're wondering, why are we here? We're not supposed to be here. And, uh, and you know, Jesus turn, looks at the, his disciples and say, okay, in this land like this, you see everything that is happening here. Um, who do you say I am now? And then we know the famous thing that happens, you know, Peter says, and then Jesus says that in the gates of Hades will not prevail. Um, right? And so it, he was giving a very geographical context to uh, his disciples to what he was sharing at the time, right? And I think uh, this is so crucial to us. Uh, um, that's actually the end of uh, my slide. But in this day and age, uh, if you asked a Buddhist, uh, Buddhist, he would say Jesus was a Buddhist. If you ask a Muslim, he would say that Jesus was a Muslim prophet and whatnot. So, uh, but who do we say uh, he is? And so to understand that scripture uh, from a geographical perspective uh, helped me uh, understand the scriptures better. Um, so uh, that's about it. There's just three instances from the Bible. The Tamarisk tree is um, ex how do we demonstrate our faith in God that our descendants, that our future generations will be moved by it and saying, okay, um, you know, for each of us, it could be different. It could be uh, something physical that we, you know, build a biblical institution and, uh, and you know, generations would be blessed by it. Uh, we leave a legacy behind. Um, and and we spoke about the wilderness. Uh, we spoke about it as an ecosystem, but then in our day-to-day -day life, it's also a seasons of life. When we go through uh, you know, a wilderness period, a season in life, uh, you know, we go to the scriptures and say, although it's in, in, I'm surrounded by uncertainty and danger, I don't know what's going to happen. There's very little provision. I'm going to depend on you because uh, he is the good shepherd. He knows where, where to lead me. Uh, you know, for my next provision, I'm going to depend on him because he's the good shepherd. He knows it. For his name's sake, he's going to lead me. Um, so that's very little I wanted to share about this. Very basic. I'm by no means an expert in this. Uh, so please direct all your questions to other faculties. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Roshan. That was so interesting. I think you should uh, think of writing a course content on biblical geography or a book on biblical geography, and that would just help. And you should teach biblical geography. And look at the claps and the thumbs up you're getting for the 
Uh, so thank you so much. I wish we had more time to just uh, keep listening to all that you have uh, researched, you've uh, studied, you've learned. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we'll take uh, questions now, if you have any questions um, on what Pastor Roshan has shared. He doesn't want to ask questions. <laughs> okay. So Divya's question is, is anything existing at Caesarea Philippi today? That, that image that I shared is from the modern day Caesarea Philippi. And so um, and a lot of these Holy Land tours, uh, you know, that happens, uh, that is one of the very famous places where uh, people are taken to and shown. This is the Caesarea Philippi. Yeah, um, the caves and uh, whatnot, yes. And also, it's very uh, interesting. There's a lot of other uh, statues of other Greek gods, uh, Roman Greek gods that they worship. One of them is uh, Echo. Um, Echo is a god that uh, that they believed who always lived in the cave, and so hence the phenomenon uh, Echo. What happens inside the cave uh, is where we get the word Echo from. But it was actually a, a Greek god that lived in the caves, according to their belief. But yeah, it's still uh, the place is still there for us to go and visit. Uh, no, uh, pagan worship still exists. Uh, uh, not, no, I, don't, I don't think so. No. Thank you, Divya, for your question. I hope uh, it was answered. Are there any more questions? Anyone else has? Okay, uh, Sam, uh, how does a modern man living in a concrete jungle have a wilderness nearness with God experience? Yes, I'm, uh, as, an, I, as I shared, uh, you know, we looked at wilderness as an ecosystem uh, itself. Uh, but in, for us, it's like seasons of life, right? We say, okay, I'm going through a wilderness period. That means what we are actually saying is uh, it's a, a dry season, a season of uncertainty, um, a season of waiting on God. Um, so one of the key verses that's always captured my attention is from Hosea. It says, I will allure her and uh, to wilderness, and there I will speak with her tenderly. Uh, and we just have to have faith and believe that, you know, in, in the wilderness season that we are in, uh, you know, he's our shepherd. That's where he speaks with us and not just speaks with us. He speaks with us tenderly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to go on too much into the Hebrew thing of uh, for the Hebrew word for wilderness and uh, everything else, but there's so much to learn about wilderness. But that basically is it's not just an ecosystem; it is a season of life where he's near to us. Thank you, Sam, for your question. Uh, thank you, Pastor Roshan, for answering those questions. Anyone else has any questions? Okay, the first question is, does Mount Hermon have any other spiritual significance? Yeah, not that I know of, but uh, anybody else can uh, feel free to answer that question. But uh, most most biblical scholars claim that that's where the transfiguration happened. Um, and I, I kind of believe that theory because of what happened in Matthew chapter 16, where, the, where Jesus asks that question. And, and then he goes into Mount Hermon, and that's where the transfiguration happens, and you know, kind of builds on that revelation. Um, but uh, if there's anything else, uh, the faculty, please feel free to add. Just reminded Mount Hermon is in Psalm 133, and it really talks about the you know, anointing, someone could be dwelling in unity in the deal of Hermon. So I think. Uh, uh, in the context of brethren dwelling in unity and the anointing, it's pointing to Mount Hermon bringing freshness, life, and so on. So the blessing of dwelling in unity, anointed, and one of those is the dew on um, the freshness and life and blessing. Thank you, Pastor. Uh... Hope that helped, uh, Divya. You have a follow-up question, Divya? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, go ahead, I, please. I thought it's better to ask. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so I've heard of uh, 
I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure if there. These are uh, certain theories out there. Uh, but I've heard of people telling that in the book of Enoch, uh, there is some some signal uh, like this Mount Hermon has some significant spiritual significance. Not sure of the validity of it, but uh, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to know if if that is a right theory kind of uh, they say the fallen angels uh, uh, they like some something like uh, uh, know how uh, in the uh, Genesis chapter 6 when it talks about the fallen angels um, and the Nephilim and all that uh, so it seems it happened on Mount Hermon. Uh, I've heard a theory like this. So I just wanted to, I was just curious to know if it has any connection with this Assyria Philippi uh, in any any way. Uh, right, Devi, I'll just share and I'll allow other faculties to share. Um, I have not read the book of Enoch or uh, uh, yeah, any other books that is not part of the canon. Um, so I, yeah, my answer remains that uh, I don't know much about uh, the other part which you just shared. But, uh, anybody else, feel free to share. Um, just like to add, I think, uh, yes, in the Jewish tradition, uh, they have, they say that Mount Hermon is associated, uh, uh, you know, with the book of Enoch, where it is believed to be the place where the fallen angels uh, descended to the earth uh, before the flood um, but you know because uh, the book of Enoch is not considered as a canonical book and hence it's not in the bible so we don't know if this Jewish tradition is true or not or it's right yeah uh, but also uh, Mount Hermon is considered to be uh, like like one of the possible sites for the biblical Lebanon uh, mentioned in the Hebrew bible so that's what uh, uh, geography also says, yeah. What was that, ma'am? Biblical? Uh, the uh, Mount Hermon is considered to be one of the possible sites for the biblical Lebanon mentioned biblical in the Bible. Lebanon? Okay. Yes, yeah. Lebanon, yes, mentioned okay. in the Bible. Okay, sure. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. That helps. Thank you, Divya. Yes. He passed the Ashish once, Pastor Roshan, to consider leading us on a tour to Israel soon. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Pratt's question is, uh, uh, what is the spiritual significance of the olive tree? Pastor Roshan? I don't know much. I mean, it was a, it, I think it was like a symbol of peace or something, um, some piece of friendship. And also olive tree, I don't know, but olive in itself, it, it, it reminded of the Gethsemane and uh, it was an olive press garden. Um, olive, the oil that you get from, the oil that you get from olives uh, or a gentle oil represents anointing and what the, So um, that is my basic understanding of its significance. <laughs> Yeah, there are a lot more trees, guys. I don't know uh, his thing about everything. <laughs> I know almond trees signifi signifies uh, new, this, this new beginning. Uh, uh, yeah, biblical botanical. Yeah, that's a different topic altogether. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor Nancy, for saving me. But uh, yes, uh, you know, like in uh, uh, Jeremiah has this vision. Uh, it, God asks him, "What do you see?" I see an almond tree. Um, almond tree was uh, what the, was the first tree in that region to come to come. Um, to spring um, after the winter has passed, had passed. So it, it signified new season, the beginning of new things. I know a little bit about almond tree, and it's also the almond tree branches that's designed in the tabernacle of Moses. Um, but yeah, that's about it. But yeah, not. We all should study about trees. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'd just like to add that, thank you, Pastor Roshan. I'd just like to add that olive tree is basically associated with the peace, a blessing, uh, prosperity. Also, it's a symbol of abundance and fruitfulness. So basically, uh, God's uh, uh, represents God's blessing upon his uh, people. 
also olive trees are known for um, you know its longevity and its ability to survive in very difficult and very um, uh, harsh terrains and conditions uh, so it can also signify you know uh, or symbolize strength and endurance and perseverance uh, when we face um, or go through challenges and 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 struggles of course we read in the bible also that olive oil was used for uh, anointing so i mean that's one of the uses of a uh, symbolic uses of olive oil it's used for uh, anointing and also it has medicinal uh, values so i think i hope that helped uh, pratt uh, did pratt ask that question yes did that help pratt yes mom it did it did okay. thank you so much thank you uh, Okay, Sam says, uh, okay, he's just saying, great session, Pastor Roshan. Uh, such a wide, uh, rich, wide perspective, the amazing word of God we are studying. Please keep this going, looking for part two, three, four of this series. <laughs> so the next few uh, uh, mentoring hours, we're looking forward to Pastor Roshan's <laughs> Sharing on. I'm, I'm trying topic. to avoid questions. I'm trying to avoid questions. See, like, what, what significance of victory? So, I, I don't think we're going to have part two, three, and four. So, <laughs> so I think he just wants us to listen to his uh, lectures and not ask any questions. So maybe the <laughs> questions can be answered by the other faculty, but we can just hear you out here. Yeah. Uh, any spiritual significance of the victory? Yeah, not that I know of. <laughs> I'm sure there is, but. Oh, no. <clears throat> Any other faculty would like to add? Oh, thank you, Pastor Ashish. Fig tree in the scriptures represent Israel. Anyone else has any thoughts on the fig tree would like to share? Hosea chapter 9, uh, verse 10, and Joel chapter 1, verse 7. Okay, thank you. Okay. Siriha says, ask for climatic differences between Canaan and Egypt. <laughs> You're getting the hardcore geography now. <laughs> yeah, I think I made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, they very similar, I guess. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else uh, would like to answer that? Climatic uh, differences between Canaan and Egypt? I mean, they're very close to the Mediterranean belt, so it's very similar in uh, that range, region and the southern part of Italy and Greece. So. The overall, the climatic thing, it's a very tropical Mediterranean kind of a, not tropical Mediterranean. That's... Okay, we'll move on to Divya's question. Are uh, Tyre and Sidon part of Israel during Jesus' times? Uh, which are the modern day Tyre and S Sidon? Okay, would uh, anyone else like to respond to that question? I think uh, Tyre and Sidon are basically, uh, uh, I think t Tyre is Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, Sidon is situated in Tyre. Uh, so I think it's, 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 it comes in the region of Lebanon, I think. And uh, yes, it's in the northern, north, northwestern part of uh, Galilee that's above uh, but so in uh, during jesus times i mean we see that he did they, they traveled in and on that region um and all the neighboring countries um but now uh, it's yeah i think yeah, like you said pastor it's in the land of lebanon 
and and yeah jordan to the right yeah, yeah. so i think uh, since uh, lebanon is not part of israel so during jesus's time tyre and sidon were not basically part of uh, uh, israel yes I hope our geography is right <laughs> yeah okay i hope that helped uh, okay mm -hmm. yeah they out, outside the they're not part of israel so but they're outside the jewish state yes okay if uh, sidiha says uh, as famine in bethlehem during ruth due to climate or god's testing time any of our faculty like to answer that please the famine that happened in bethlehem was uh, during the time of ruth and naomi just a just a thought here that you know when when we do read about famine famines uh, or other weather catastrophes in the Bible, uh, most often we should recognize them as you know, being just natural events taking place, and then God leading and guiding His people through those natural events. As in, as in the, there was a famine during Isaac's time. Uh, there's a fulfillment during uh, uh, now this time. So those were just natural things. It wasn't like God judging the land or judging the people. Uh, this is we have famines in through, through the centuries. There have been those rare occasions when the Bible specifically says that there was judgment. Uh, so then we recognize that as uh, Dealing with the sin of the people judging the people. But otherwise, in general, uh, we recognize these as natural other so, uh, Thank you, Pasashish. Uh, hope that uh, helped uh, Siriha. Okay, we'll uh, move on. We have. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pasashish, for answering that question. Uh, we'll move on to Prince's question. Uh, out of all the places or uh, land, why does uh, why did God choose to give the land of Canaan as a promised land for Israel? Uh, the physical geography has any reason for it? I mean, we all know that it was called uh, call it as the land flowing with milk and honey, um, and so it was. Uh, a nourished and a fertile land it was rich in its natural resources and uh, we know that part of it and uh, yeah and why specifically uh, i don't know why but uh, yes uh, anybody else would like to add to that please do so anyone else would like to share on that or answer that question. So, I like uh, Pastor Roshan said, yes, it was a land flowing with milk and honey, it was very rich, very fertile land, and God wants to uh, always give his best to his children and to ch his uh, children to enjoy the best in everything, whether it's land or any other area. So, uh, so he promised uh, Abraham that he would uh, give him and his descendants the land of uh, Canaan. Um, also, I think the land of Canaan was uh, basically, uh, you know, a very strategical place in terms of uh, trade routes. I think it was very strategically located uh, for trade routes uh, with other uh, uh, places around the land of uh, Canaan. So like Egypt or Africa, just, uh, yeah. you know, so... Um, Maybe also for trade and commerce. Scott just wanted them to enjoy the best. Yes. Uh, yeah, the place of Beersheba, where Abraham planted the tamarisk tree, later on becomes to be uh, goes on to become a very powerful uh, uh, place for commerce and trading in the southern part of Jerusalem. So, as well, just adding to your point. Yes. 
Thank you, Pastor Roshan. I hope that it helped uh, Prince. Okay. Um, Pastor Nancy's question, while God speaks and communicates through everything, land and trees, etc., is there a danger of over-interpreting these things? Uh, simple answer, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Pastor, I think... Uh, I mean, you when we interpret, we interpret every, the scriptures in the in the, in the light of all the scriptures, right? We don't take one verse and take it out of context, it, it because it has the potential. And I think uh, we can. It, there's a possibility for us to overinterpret things, but um, we just be careful, do enough study, and see how it's consistent with the rest of the scriptures. And to answer Divya's question as well, yes. Yeah, so Pastor uh, Roshan has already answered Divya's question. I hope, uh, Nancy, your, answer, uh, your question is answered and also... Okay, yeah, thanks. Yes. Anyone else has any questions? Yes, Kofi. Please, I would like to know whether Abraham ever lived in the land of Canaan before his death. Yes, so uh, when Abraham planted uh, the, the tamarisk tree, it was the land of Canaan. He just didn't know that. Um, and uh, yeah, and when you look at his journey as well, he uh, starts a journey from the land of Ur, which is on the other side of. Um, the land, and he travels up north, and he comes. And so he was there, but he just didn't know that was. And he knew that. I think in the book of Hebrews also, he said, uh, he says that um, he, although he knew that he did not own a foothold, uh, you know, in that land. So that just goes on to say that yeah, he did live there. Thank you. Yes, any other questions? Thank you, uh, Kofi, for your question. Genesis 12, 5, and uh, Genesis 13, 12. Oh, just, just saying that Abraham came there. Okay, these are uh, scripture portions that are talking about uh, Abraham coming to the land of Canaan and living in the land of Canaan, yes. Thank you, Pastor Ashish. Anyone else has any questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, then we'll uh, end the mentoring hour. Thank you all for your interesting questions. Thank you, Pastor Roshan, for your interesting talk. Uh, and we look forward for more uh, sessions. Um, We'll end now. Thank you all for joining the mentoring hour. Uh, have a blessed uh, day uh, and a week ahead. God bless you. Thank you so much.